So, I will continue with my previous talk that is uh, the microelectronic technology for memory. Uh, here we have started discussion on the deposition of the thin film materials. So, one of the technique is a spin casting technique that already I have discussed and now I will discuss some other technique by which we can get thin films that is evaporation technique. So, this particular technique used some evaporator and the basic principle is mentioned here. We load certain wafers into a high vacuum chamber which is commonly pumped with either diffusion pump or a cryo pump. So, now why we need this vacuum chamber? Because vacuum chamber is required to reduce the contamination from the environment. At the same time, if you evaporate any material in vacuum, its melting point and evaporation temperature will be less. So, these are the two reasons why we need vacuum for evaporation of certain materials. So, now if you use vacuum chamber, so you have to use certain vacuum pumps and those pumps are two kinds, one is oil pump, other is oil free pump. So, in earlier days we used to depend only on oil pumps that is rotary pump or diffusion pump or turbo molecular pump, but nowadays a separate class of pumps are available which you can use and there, is, there will not be any contamination from the oil, you know oil is a source of hydrocarbon contamination. So, now if you use pumps which use oils, so there is a chance of some contamination of hydrocarbon into the vacuum chamber or into the film. So, nowadays all most of the uh, most of the vacuum chambers in VLSI laboratory, they use oil free pumps, they are namely the cryo pumps or the molecular ion pump or the sublimation pump. The cryo pump they use liquid cryogenic material basically liquid nitrogen which basically condense most of the gas molecules which can condense temperature near temperature of the liquid nitrogen. So, those will be condensed and that will be absorbed by certain materials. So, automatically vacuum will be created. So, you know in a in a in atmosphere the major portion is nitrogen. So, you, you can liquefy nitrogen and oxygen will liquefy before nitrogen. So, if these two constituents are liquefied then automatically the, the in, 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 in atmosphere most of the gases are, are, are gone. So, pressure will go down. So, that is the basic principle by cryo pump, after then you can use the ion pump and then you can use sublimation pump for very high vacuum level. So, now in this evaporator one should be the one vacuum chamber is used which is evacuated by certain pumps, then what is the next thing you need? Next thing you need a crucible and on which you put the material and you by applying certain power electrical power you can evaporate those material. The material will melt in the crucible and this crucible is heated by means of embedded heater and an external power supply. And when you melt that crucible, then the material will be evaporated and it will be deposited on the wafer. So, that is the basic principle. You need a vacuum chamber, you create vacuum you put the material on an evaporator that is crucible, then you apply certain electric power into the crucible and crucible becomes hot and when the temperature exceeds the, the melting point of this particular material, so material will evaporate. So, this is the basic working principle of a simple evaporator. Now, you can see here the schematic diagram of that evaporator, this is a vacuum chamber and on the vacuum chamber this is the diffusion pump and using that diffusion pump you can replace the diffusion pump by the as I mentioned by cryo pump also or other sophisticated oil free pump and the required vacuum is of the order of 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power 7 torr means 
10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7 millimeter of mercury. And you have to have certain sample holding frame, this is the sample holding frame and there is a crucible, this is a crucible here, you can see the crucible here and there is a shutter because when you raise the power of the crucible, heated crucible you raise the power, then it started, started evaporation. So, if you put the shutter, those evaporative material will not deposit, I need when it is in full form, so temperature raised at a high value. So, the advantage there is, there is no chances of nucleation, nucleation formation, because if high temperature, if you reach the complete uh, the evaporation temperature, then everybody will melt it uniformly, the uniform evaporation and there is a less chance of nucleation on the film. So, that is not desirable, nucleation formation is not desirable. So, that is why sometimes the shutter is used and on the same time, when you got the desired thickness of the film, then you want to switch off the power supply to the crucible. So, if you gradually switch off, then even then since it is a hot, some material will be evaporated. So, it will go on depositing beyond your expectation. So, you put the shutter, so the evaporant will not reach on the crucible. So, automatically the, the deposition will be stopped on the uh, slice. Okay. So, that is why the shutter is required. So, these are the five components in a simple evaporator system. Now, the pressure inside the chamber is less than 1 milliliter, it has to be. The vapor atoms travel in the chamber in a straight line until they strike a surface where they accumulate as a film. So, now here is again shown the schematic, the wafers are here and in the, in the Belger surface is the wafers are kept here. This is the charge means material, this is a crucible and this is the pump, one is a roughing pump, this is a backing pump, this is a diffusion pump, this is a cold trap, cold trap means liquid nitrogen trap. In a in the diffusion pump, the diffusion oil is evaporated and it condensed back using some cold trap and when it condensed back, so automatically it drags some of the air molecules from the chamber and it is vented outside. So, as a result of which the chamber will be evacuated, that is the basic principle of the diffusion pump. So, and uh, here is the vent gas, so the vent uh, is required when and to when you want to make uh, the chamber to atmospheric pressure. So, you have to increase some amount of gas here, so that inside outside pressure is same, you can open the bell jar and you can take out the substrate. So, that is why some venting mechanism has to be there. So, now here one thing is told, the pressure inside the chamber should be very, very low, 1 milliliter or less. So, the reason is that, so for getting uniform deposition of the metal on the uh, or metal or any material on the surface. So, you need high vacuum. If vacuum is low, then mean free path will be low because there will be if vacuum is low, there is a chances of high collision between the evaporated molecules. Because of the, the collision, so the evaporated molecules will not travel in a straight line path. If it does not travel in a straight line path, so then the problem is the deposition on the wafer will not be uniform. So, due to the scattering among the molecules, so the deposition will be highly non-uniform. So, that is why we need the vacuum inside the chamber to a high value. So, maybe 10 to the power minus 6 torr is a very good vacuum for evaporation. Okay. So, other point is evaporation system may contain up to 4 crucible to allow deposition of multiple layers without breaking vacuum. So, this is one crucible shown. So, similar 3, 4 crucibles you can attach so that without breaking the vacuum, so one material you can deposit, then you feed power to the second crucible, so second material will be evaporated, then you feed power to the third crucible, third material will be evaporated. When you want to evaporate certain material, so the other crucible are covered by the shutter, so that from there no contamination can come. So, in this way, there is a possibility of layer by layer different film you can evaporate. For example, as I mentioned earlier, the chromium gold, so is required, always gold alone will not serve your purpose, you need chromium and gold. So, you can have two crucible, in one crucible chromium and another crucible gold, so chromium is evaporated, then put the shutter over the chromium source, then, then feed power to the gold crucible, the gold is, will be evaporated. So, without breaking the vacuum, so two material 
you can you can deposit. Another is possible that is a co-evaporation. If you want to have the alloy film, so alloy film is sometimes required to make some thin film resistance. Okay, nichrome, nickel and chromium alloy. So there is also that is also possible if you feed power both the crucible. So both chromium and nickel will evaporate, fermentation they will mix together and deposition will be uh, the uh, the alloy deposition. Okay. So, both alloy deposition and layer by layer individual deposition is possible by using the multiple crucible inside the vacuum chamber. So, evaporation system thus you can it can accommodate if it is a big bell jar you can use it chamber it can accommodate more than one crucible to get uh, various kinds of films. Now, a complete evaporation evaporator system is shown here. The wafers up to 24 can be sus suspended in a frame above crucible and the bottom you can see the diagram here the picture is it, it is a it, you see the this circular wafers are fixed on the wafer holder and this wafer holder are placed on the top of the chamber and it can rotate. So, this individual wafers will rotate in its own axis uh, axis of the holder and the two three holders together it can rotate around the central uh, axis of the evaporation chamber. That means, you can get two axis rotation which is known as planetary rotation and the planetary rotation helps you to get uniform film thickness on the surface of the wafer. Okay. And this kind of arrangement is attached nowadays in most of the vacuum evaporator system. So, planetary rotation that is two axis rotation. Each individual wafer will rotate in its own axis and the holders also will rotate around the central axis of the evaporation chamber. Okay. There is two axis rotation like planets moving in the solar system. So, now this is uh, the picture and mechanical shutters in front of crucible may help abrupt start and stop. I just mentioned uh, the use of the mechanical shutter at the same time alloy deposition is possible with this particular machine. Now, the I am just uh, now switch over to the uh, the filament, what kind of filaments or crucible you can use it. There are three kind of evaporation you can use, one uh, is known as the electron beam evaporation, another is known as the RF induction heating evaporation and the third is the, the resistive heating evaporation. So, resistive heating evaporation is shown in the diagram some of the crucible here you can see the heated spiral or you can dimple both spiral both can be used. So, this is the heating element. So, this is normally made of either tungsten or molybdenum because molybdenum or tungsten will have very high melting point. So, that you can use materials which melted below the melting point of tungsten or molybdenum and that is nearly 2000 degree centigrade. Now, the source material is inserted into the into the into the crystal here into sorry into the, the spiral here and then uh, if you apply uh, the current if you allow the current flowing through the, the coil. So, automatically it will be red hot this resistive heating principle basically I square R is the heat generation. So, it will be red hot and this material will be melted and it will be evaporated and this kind of arrangement is useful if the source is in the form of rod or form of stick, but if the source is in the form of the powder then this kind of arrangement will not help you then you have to go for the dimple boat arrangement where the in the central there is a small boat and there you can put the charge powder form charge and then if you apply uh, the power, power or current through this boat. So, it will be heated and evaporation will take place. So, this is the basic resistance heated evaporation filaments. So, if you there are salient points on this particular evaporation technique which are it is very simple and inexpensive technique. There is no ionizing radiation takes place from this resistive heated evaporation. Charge requirement is very small, short filament life is the advantage and contamination from the heating element sorry short filament life is disadvantage not advantage. Because if you use uh, frequently this kind of filament if the 
if the current flow is not uniform through that, then sometime the some location of the filament will be excessively heated and because of that, that uh, that uh, point will be the weak point and then it filament may break and that is that happens because when the source will melt. So, it will agglomerate certain position some of the filament uh, you can uh, rings will be short circuited, short circuited means resistance will be less, current will be more, current will be more means I square into R. So, heat generation will be more. So, that means heat generation along the filament will not be uniform. In that case in some location heat generation is more obviously the there is a chance of breaking of that particular filament two reason one is that filament that particular portion will be soft and the second reason is again you know thermal expansion coefficient mismatch if the temperature or heat of the throughout the filament wire is different at different location. Because of that there will be uh, the breaking of the uh, of the filament that is why life of the filament is short. And another disadvantage of this technique is contamination from the filament because the melt the material which is which is evaporated that molten material will be in touch with the filament either boat or the or the uh, the uh, spiral wire. So, some of the constituents from the filament will evaporate also along with the material as a result of which the film will be contaminated with the filament material. So, that is disadvantage and small charge because here in this boat you cannot uh, accommodate large amount of material or in the filament you cannot accommodate very large amount of source. So, if you need very thicker film then you have you may go for 2, 3 filament. Small filament can accommodate small charge and the total film thickness on the wafer may be very small that is one kind of the disadvantage. Okay. Now, the second technique we are going to use is heated uh, inductively heated evaporation. Here you can see in the uh, crucible it is made of boron nitride material because boron nitride uh, melting temperature is very very high and is not only that it is uh, basically if you use the inductive coil it should not be metal it is a insulator boron nitride is an insulator also. So, uh, here is the molten charge and the, the RF induction heating is used to melt this charge. Okay. So, that means here again the molten material is in contact with the crucible. So, the conduction or contamination, contamination from the crucible will still be there, but one advantage compared to the earlier process is that here you can accommodate more charge. So, if the volume of the material here in the in the in the in the crucible is large compared to the filament which is used in resistive evaporation technique. So, in that respect you can have uh, evaporation for a long time. So, you can have a larger thickness of the deposited film on the wafer by using the inductively heated evaporation. Okay. And disadvantage of this is again mandatory use of crucible and another advantage is known no ionizing radiation. Okay. Ionizing radiation is not desired, and the ionizing radiation is 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 visible in some kind of evaporation, which is known as electron beam evaporation. So, electron beam evaporation technique is shown here. Here, what is being done? A crucible is used here. This is a charge, and here is a filament from which the electrons are ejected, basically the cathode rays, and now some accelerate, accelerating grid is there and through that accelerating grid those electrons are, are ejected accelerated and they are deflected using electrostatic or electromagnetic field. If you apply certain electric field then deflection will be there because the electrons are charged particle. Then here is a magnetic field high magnetic field so that the electron beam will be deflected and it may be focused to a certain point and after focusing it that point is incident on the crucible. So, that means electron beam generation, then acceleration, then guiding, guiding the beam. So, through the, the electrostatic deflecting plates or magnets, then it will be focused to a point and this high energy electron beam is incident on the charge and as a result of which locally heat will be transferred to the charge and locally it will be melted. 
so and it will be evaporated. Now, this particular focused beam if you can scan over the surface, so only surface will melt and from there evaporation will take place. So, since the complete material is not going to melt, so there is no chances of contamination from the crucible, because from the surface only the kinetic energy of the electron beam is transferred and because of that transfer of energy locally it is melting, because local melting is taking place and so less contamination from the crucible, almost no contamination from the crucible. So, that is the advantage and here also you can use a large source, because depending on the, uh, the capacity of the crucible you can use more material for evaporation and uniform thick metal films, because you are using large amount of charge you can have uniform thick metal film and the purity of the film will be good compared to earlier two techniques, co evaporation to form alloy and multiple source. These are the points, because similar crucible if you use side by side. So, one by one first electron may be focused in this charge. So, then in the next charge you, you can focus it, so that will be evaporated, then in the next that will be evaporated. So, one by same electron beam can be used for, for heating the material from one heart another name of the crucible is heart, from one heart to second heart to third heart. So, in that way one by one you can just deposit the material and if you want to make alloy material that is also possible, then you have to have two electron source here. There are two heart, two electron electron uh, beam source, so different beam will, will uh, be incident on the different material, so automatically the evaporation will take place. So, this is the basic principle of the electron beam evaporation. Here the disadvantage are shown here, the for accelerating the electron beam you need very high voltage, nearly 10 kilo volt voltage is required. So, this 10 kilo volt acceleration voltage if it is incident on the aluminum for example, or any metal they can produce x ray because X-ray principle is also you know that is high energy electron beam is incident on a target and from the target X-ray is emitted. So, that means there is a chance of ionizing radiation in this particular technique. So, the metal may be contaminated with those, those ions okay, which is uh, basically X-ray or other rays may be emitted after hitting this accelerated electron onto the material. So, the ionization radiation and, and another is to another important point is that that beam is to be focused. So, if that beam is not properly focused then may be secondary ion emission from other material. So, that secondary ion emission from other periphery material it may contaminate the film also, okay. but if with proper care if you take then you can get very high purity film using the electron beam evaporation technique. Okay. So, now there is another technique by which you can deposit thin films, so that is a sputter deposition. Sputtering was developed by Langmuir in 1920, so it has got certain advantage. What are those advantages? Sputtering technique will have better step coverage than evaporation, addition of magnetic field improves step coverage, this is important because you see. In, in case of interconnected metallization, so the surface of the MEMS uh, if you go machining at the beginning, so then it is not uniform or not planar. So, there will be a lot of the ups and downs. So, so this ups and downs means there will be certain steps over the surface. That is also true in case of VLSI also. So, there is a one demand or need that all the steps should be covered by the aluminum or whatever metal you are using the metal film. So, that on the surface you need the planar metal. So, the planarity is another important aspect when you go for deposition of any of the films. So, for, for ensuring the planarity you have to use certain techniques which cover all the steps. So, this is one technique the sputter deposition by which the step coverage uh, uh, will be better than the evaporation. It induces less radiation damage than EVM technique. 
sparking technique that 10 kilo volt or higher electron beam is not used. So, radiation damage is less that is advantage high deposition rate offered by modern design. If you design the sparking chamber properly the evaporation rate will be higher. So, that these are the advantage other advantages are also mentioned here. It is capable of depositing and maintaining complex alloy composition capable of depositing reflected metals at high temperature, capable of maintaining well controlled uniform deposition or large wafer. Now, this the complex alloy composition or refractory metal because refractory metal capability is one unique thing because you see the basic principle of the sparkling is the basically you have to create certain ions, the ions will be accelerated that is positive ions not electron beam. So, positive ions why? Because it will have higher mass, if you can energize it, its impact will be more when it hits on the surface. So, as a result of which it will dislodge some of the materials from the target. So, that is the basic material, basic mechanism of the spark ring. So, now here one point is mentioned the alloy composition will be you see deposition and maintaining complex alloy composition. So, now if you make the target beforehand with proper stoichiometric ratio. Then, if in sputter deposition in the same ratio the material will come out and it will deposit, but if you go for the, uh, the electron beam or uh, the elastic heating technique by using simultaneous sim evaporation of the material then controlling of the composition with certain stoichiometric ratio will be difficult, but here in case of sputtering the target composition for fixed composition, fixed stoichiometric ratio composition you can have and then if you use that particular target then in the film more or less you can ensure that composition, may not be the exact composition of the target it depends on the yield of the individual components in the alloy, but you will have better the alloy composition compared to the earlier test. Okay. Other than that, there are another advantages in case of sputter deposition. There, high energy plasma overcomes temperature limitation. That is why you can have the refractory metal evaporation. Because refractory metal, if you want to evaporate using the, the, uh, the earlier techniques of resistive heated or inductive heated evaporation, you have to increase the temperature to a high value because refractory metals evaporation temperature is very high, melting point is very high. For example, tungsten, molybdenum. If you want to evaporate that material, you have to raise the temperature nearly say 1800 or 1600 degree centigrade. So, very difficult, but if you use a sputter technique, so it is different technique. So, there without raising the temperature to a high value, you can deposit those refracted metals very easily. Now, co sputtering allows us to control the atomic ratio of the species that I already told you mentioned you. Trapping of gas molecules causes anomalies and its mechanical properties. These are these two points are disadvantage of sputtering technique. One is a trapping of gas molecules because in sputtering you are using some ion, those ions are normally argon ions are used. So, in the in the field may be some argon ions will be trapped. So, because of the trapping of the argon ions the property of the film may little bit change, mechanical property also may change. And other important point is a stress. Stress is another very important point of thin film deposition and this stress it depends on the specific sparkling condition. Okay. That too is very critical to manage in case of sparter, or sparter technique. So, now this is a chamber sparkling chamber here basically this is the target you see in the top and bottom is the wave, uh, the substrate holder. These are the wafers kept and now this is a vacuum chamber all this sputtering or evaporation is done in some vacuum. I told you the reason of vacuum using vacuum chamber. Now, if you apply power, so first uh, the, the one will be the cathode another will be the anode. Now, since the positive ions you are creating so, you have to keep the wafers on the cathode. So, if the if, if you apply certain electric field in between the two plates, so the argon gas will be ionized. 
ionization of the argon gas with the gas inlet is basically the, uh, the we normally use argon gas. So, if it is ionized, so the the ionized means e, e, the, the positive ion. So, obviously, uh, e, if target is negative, it will it will uh, basically proceed towards the target if the target is kept negative. So, then it will bombard on the target. So, after bombardment, so the target material will come out and since you are keeping the wafers at the bottom, those materials will fall down and it will deposit on the wafer. So, that is the basic uh, uh, mechanism of the simple sputtered system and the one of the limitation here, the particular material to be sputtered is made into a disc or target that is thermally bonded to the cathode. So, this is a back plate is a cathode and you have to thermally bond the disc. That means, source material if you want to deposit has to be in the form of the target. No powder, no rod or no flex is used in case of sputtering. You have to have certain target. So, you have to prepare the target material first, then you can go for the sputter deposition. So, another important aspect is the gap between the cathode and anode. So, this is less than 10 centimeter we have seen. Argon plasma is sustained between the electrodes. The closer the target to the wafer, the higher the deposition rate, obviously. So, if the, to, if the target is close to the, the wafer, so higher will be the deposition rate. So, these are parameters of the deposition. One is the, the gap between the cathode and anode, another is the pressure inside the chamber, vacuum inside the chamber, another is the, the ions density. That means, you have to in some sputter chamber, the, uh, the plasma that is ions means ion collection of ions in a, in a system is basically plasma. So, confinement of the plasma, argon plasma is another important aspect. If you confine those, so plasma density will be higher, so where the deposition will be more. So, that means it depends on many parameters like the pressure inside the chamber, like the voltage applied, like the physical distance between the cathode and anode. So, the your uh, the deposition rate also will change and quality of the film also will change. Now, uh, these are uh, the some of the points which I just talk is mentioned here. The gas pressure in the chamber is about 0.1 torr. Plasma chamber is designed such that a high density of ion strikes a target containing the material to be deposited. Simple DC sputtering is used for elemental metal deposition. For deposition of insulating materials such as silicon dioxide, silicon nitride and, R and RF plasma is used because for metal can be used as a cathode. You can attach with the cathode, but if it is the insulator then uh, very difficult for DC sputtering because you cannot get the negative field at the insulator. So, then you have to go for RF, RF energy. So, for in for deposition of the insulator material, the DC sputtering is not used, rather you have to go for the RF sputtering technique. Now, next topic is the oxidation of silicon. So, this is a important material which is used in case of microelectronic devices as well as MEMS devices. Silicon dioxide is basically a dielectric material which is formed from silicon reaction with oxygen or reaction with H2O molecules and that particular material formation is also very easy by thermal techniques and is a very good microelectronic material. And this particular material is used as a mask against implantation or diffusion of dopant into the silicon. That means, mask means it will uh, prohibit diffusion or implantation in that particular region when you open the windows through which the implantation or diffusion will take place. So, that means silicon dioxide is used as a mask. Second is the isolation among components in IC that in integrated circuit the silicon dioxide is used for isolation because it is a dielectric. So, in between two devices if you want to isolate. So, when you are making the transistors or FETs or whatever it is. So, in between the two device, if you fill with the silicon dioxide, so automatically they are 
isolated each other. So, it is used for isolation also. Third application is components in MOS structure that is a gate electrode. Silicon dioxide is used as a gate material that is a component in MOS structure. Then it is isolation in multi level metallization scheme. In case of VLSI you know there are 3, 4, 5, 6, even 7 to 8 layers metallizations are used nowadays. So, obviously from one layer to other layer you have to isolate. So, for that isolation you have you can use silicon dioxide as a dielectric material in between two metal layers for isolation. So, that is one application of the silicon dioxide for multi level metallization scheme isolation. Then another application is anti reflective coating for photodiode devices. It has got very good anti reflective coating, but you can absorb the the uh, the radiation. So, in case of photodiode or in case of uh, other optical devices, it can be used for as a anti reflective coating. So, these are the various applications of silicon dioxide and there are certain growth techniques of silicon dioxide. One technique is known as the native silicon native silicon dioxide growth. That means, if the silicon itself is converted into silicon dioxide that is known as native growth of silicon dioxide locally silicon is converted into silicon dioxide and that particular technique is very much used because in that technique you can get very high quality dense silicon dioxide and there are different techniques of native silicon dioxide growth one technique is known as the thermal oxidation and the there is a one is a dry oxidation and where you can use only dry oxygen and the dry oxygen is reacted with silicon it will form silicon dioxide is known as the dry oxidation. Second is wet oxidation their oxidation species are the oxygen molecule or H 2 molecule. Basically H 2 will decompose into hydrogen and oxygen and the same oxygen will be used for ox forming silicon dioxide layer. So, dry oxidation wet oxidation third is steam oxidation if you use only H2O molecule as a oxidation oxidation species, then it is known as steam oxidation. Here no separate oxygen gas is used, but if you use combination of oxidation and H2O molecule, then it is called weight oxidation. Next is pyrogenic oxidation. Here basically pyrogenic steam is used. What is that? That is hydrogen and oxygen gas separately used and then it will form the H 2 O molecule and that H 2 O molecule will act as an oxidation species. Then what is the difference between steam and pyrogenic? The difference is in the in the steam the water vapor is used, but here the gases are used. The reason is that in water vapor there may be some contamination, but here the high purity gas hydrogen oxygen if you use there is no chance of contamination. If you use H 2 O molecule there is a formation of the peaks because H 2 O when it will decompose it will get oxygen on hydrogen, but if it is not as a molecule H 2 O it can create some nucleation on the surface. So, as a result of which there may be some defects and peaks if you use high pressure steam. On the other hand if you use free high purity gas of hydrogen and oxygen and if you form the steam high pure steam inside on the surface of the uh, the silicon wafer then that they will uh, uh, the they will form uh, both oxygen and h2 o molecule and they will form native silicon dioxide and then growth rate will be fast and purity will be high compared to the h2o h2o or steam oxidation and weight oxidation nowadays in most of the cases in vlsi they use pyrogenic oxidation but only problem is that if you use hydrogen as a separate gas entity, the handling of hydrogen gas is not easy because hydrogen burns itself. And if you use oxygen and hydrogen together to form H2 molecule, so this there is a chance of explosion, is not it? So, that is why uh, uh, the, in the total system there should not be any leak, and you have to take a great precaution if you use the pyrogenic oxidation. That is why until and unless the safety arrangement is assured the pyrogenic oxidation one should not do it, one should not go for pyrogenic oxidation. The another technique is high pressure oxidation that can be wet and dry. 
because in other oxy, uh, the oxidation techniques which I mentioned that may be uh, done at atmospheric pressure, but sometimes we need at high pressure oxidation because we need faster growth of oxide. So, for faster growth of oxide, if you increase the pressure inside the chamber, the growth rate will be faster because over a small time you will get thicker oxide layer, sometimes it is also required, but the quality of that oxide will not be as good as the dry oxidation which is very slow. So, in some cases we may not require very good quality oxide, moderate quality oxide if you need, then you go for the uh, either steam oxidation or high pressure oxidation. For example, filling up groups for isolation technique, you may require say, say 7 micron or 5 micron of silicon dioxide. If you go for thermal oxidation, normal pressure, atmospheric pressure, it may take 2, 3 days, maybe 50 hours, 60 hours like that. Even then, you may, may not get it, but if you go for the high pressure oxidation, growth rate will be very fast. Over a small time, you can get thicker oxide at a high pressure. Okay. So, these are the thermal oxidation, dry, wet, steam, pyrogenic and high pressure. There is another technique which is known as halogenic oxidation. Here is some halogenic materials is used that is chlorine and that halogenic material will help to purify the oxide because in your system, if there is any any uh, the alkaline uh, element like sodium and potassium are there, the chlorine atom will react with that, they will form sodium silicon or potassium chloride which is easily dissolved in water. So, that the sodium and potassium ions contamination can be can be uh, can be uh, protected by using some chlorine incorporation into the chamber. So, that is why in some cases halogenic oxidation is also popular in case of MOS grade high purity oxide growth. And these are basically thermal oxidation techniques you are growing. Another technique is deposition which is known as the anodization. Anodization is basically the process of e extension of the electrolysis process because there one cathode anode inside the electrolytic cell and if you if you take water and decompose the water, the water uh, will be H plus and OH minus. So, OH minus will go towards the positive electrode anode and there the OH minus there with silicon it will form SiOH hole twice and SiOH hole twice lateral decompose with silicon dioxide and hydrogen. So, that is the electrolysis process basically you need a electrolytic cell and there you can deposit the silicon dioxide not grown from the native that is different. Here in other techniques you are grown from the native silicon, but here anodization you are depositing, depos, depositing the silicon dioxide as a molecule on the surface of the silicon. So, these are growth techniques and now these are the reactions are shown several reactions silicon oxygen, silicon dioxide, there is a dry oxidation H2O, H plus OH minus, this OH minus is reacted with silicon, it form SiOH hole twice, this SiOH hole twice again decompose, it will form silicon dioxide and hydrogen gas will evolve. So, total reaction is silicon plus 2 H2O will give you silicon dioxide plus 2 H2, the, this will evolve and this will uh, 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 leave certain pores. So, because you see if some H2O molecules is there, obviously the hydrogen gas is to be evolved from the surface. So, during reaction if the hydrogen gas evolves, so then the problem is during the uh, uh, during the ejection process of the hydrogen gas, it will leave certain pores into the crystal. So, density of the uh, density of the silicon dioxide material will not be high if you go for steam oxidation go for weight oxidation, but if you use only oxy, uh, dry oxidation using oxygen, there is no residual gas, there is no formation of hydrogen. In that case, you can get very good quality silicon dioxide and density will be very high, less pores and those dry oxide, dry oxidation technique is used in formation of the gate oxide in case of MOS, because there you need very good quality oxide. Okay. 
Now, here is certain things are shown how the uh, this is silicon, how the oxide is formed. So, here either oxygen H 2 molecules are, are flowing over the silicon. So, obviously, some of the gas molecules will come in, con in contact with silicon and silicon dioxide will form. So, when silicon dioxide is formed, then the top layer will be the silicon, then this oxidation species will not come in contact with the silicon. So, those species should diffuse to the silicon dioxide and then it will come in at the interface, the reaction will take place, then the silicon dioxide will grow. So, as the thickness grows, the interface goes down, thickness goes upward, the SI SiO2 interface goes down, that is one important parameter and an important factor. At the same time, you can see since after the growth of certain thickness, the, the growth rate is controlled by the diffusion also, so it will be slowed down. Initially, it will be fast. Initially, when there is no silicon dioxide, the reaction is controlled by surface reaction rate constant. But later on, when certain thickness of oxide is grown, then the growth rate is controlled by the diffusion phenomena. Because first, these oxidizing species means either oxygen or H2 molecule will diffuse to the silicon dioxide, then it will come in contact with the silicon interface then oxide will grow. Okay. This is the growth mechanism and now since SI and oxygen is combined to form SiO2, so thickness increases. If you see the volume and molecular weight of the oxygen and silicon, then it has been observed that 1 micron of silicon, if it converts into silicon dioxide, it will produce 2.22 micron of silicon dioxide the volume increases, 1 micron of silicon, this 1 micron silicon will give you 2.22 micron of silicon dioxide. Okay. So, now there are other uh, the uh, deposi deposition techniques, one is a chemical vapor deposition CVD, that obviously here the, uh, the, uh, the constituents will be some form of the chemical. So, chemical vapor, chemical vapor will decompose to form certain layers and that layer may be dielectric layer, that may be, may be metallic layer. If you use a metal organic compound, then you can get metal film deposition by using the CVD technique. CVD technique is very, very useful and very much used nowadays in, in integrated circuits and MEMS and basically is a defined as the formation of a non-volatile solid film as a substrate by the reaction of vapor phase chemical that contain the required constituents. You have to have a chemical in vapor phase which will have that, that constituent and that will deposit as a solid after decomposition. CBD is an extremely popular and is preferred deposition method for a wide range of material. Now, what kind of materials you use in case of CBD technique, in using CBD technique? The one is a polysilicon film deposition, in polycrystal silicon you can get using CBD technique dielectric film like silicon dioxide, silicon nitride you can have, single crystal epitaxial growth that is also a CVD process, single crystal silicon is known as epitaxial formation that means or epitaxial means ordered growth you can get using CVD technique, metal film deposition if you use organometallic compound just now I mentioned tungsten, molybdenum etcetera you can deposit using the CVD technique, these are the various application. Now, CBD reaction mechanisms I am just discussing. So, here what are the reaction? First, transport of the reacting gaseous species to the substrate surface. Then what is the next step? Absorption or chemisorption of the species on the substrate surface because those species after transportation you have the, that has to be absorbed. Third step is heterogeneous reaction catalyzed by the substrate surface. Next step is desorption of the gases reaction product. What are the byproducts? Desorption should be there, rest of the gases. Transport of reaction products away from the substrate surface. So, these are the steps, five steps followed one by one in a CVD reaction chamber. So, now this is a simple thermal CVD reactor system. So, this is a gas inlet, 
So, the, this is the susceptor on which the wafers are kept and susceptors are heated. Susceptor means container of the silicon wafer. So, if you heat it, then gas is flown onto the surface of the wafer. So, in this reaction chamber at high temperature, the gas will decompose and the solid material will deposit on the substrate. Here, the what are the gases used? One is silane SiH4 gas form. So, it will decompose first at high temperature SiH2 gas plus 2 H2 that is also gas. Then SiH2 it again changes to SiH2 A means amorphous and then SiH2 amorphous will give silicon solid and H2 gas. So, this is the reaction step. First SiH4 at high temperature decomposes into SiH2, then SiH2 gas to amorphous, then from amorphous SiH2 to silicon solid and hydrogen gas. Okay. So, after absorption then the solid material is coming out and it is deposited. Deposition reaction occurs at the surface of the wafer. So, now th there is another uh, the CBD technique which is known as LPCBD, low pressure chemical vapor deposition. So, to achieve reasonable deposition uniformity, the process is designed to keep the reaction strictly controlled by deposition kinetics. So, in this way in the chamber you can stack the wafers, this is the heating element, this is the furnace tube, the gas inlet you are ejecting, gas means the reactant gases are coming up, this is one reaction chamber. And one of the advantage of this LPCVD is to prohibit the formation of nucleation. So, if you do the, the complete uh, reaction inside a chamber which is at a low pressure, the nucleation of the particle will not be there. If the chamber pressure is high, the nucleation will be there. What is the nucleation? Silicon, silicon, two, three molecule together form a nucleus and that partic particular particle will deposit onto the wafer. That means, that is a defect. We need if you go for single crystal silicon, we need a ordered growth molecule by molecule just like building a house by using brick. But instead of that, if the silicon particles are conglomerated and two, three particles together form a partic particulate and that particulate means that is a nucleation and that nucleation stops. So, if one defect is formed that defect will continue throughout the crystal and that crystal you cannot use. If you use it at a low pressure CBD, so formation of the nucleation of the particles can be prohibited, can be prevented. Okay. So, this is the low pressure CBD uh, 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 the uh, technique and it is, it is much more better than the atmospheric pressure CBD. Okay. Let me stop here today. So, next class we will continue with the, uh, the same topic that is microelectronic technology for MEMS. Thank you very much. We will continue our discussion on microelectronic technology for MEMS. In the last lecture, already we have discussed on the deposition techniques, namely the evaporation, chemical vapor deposition and various kinds of evaporation techniques also. Today's lecture will continue on discussion on different topics like metallization, lithography diffusion and ion implantation. All these steps are very much required for fabrication of microsensors and MEMS. Let us first discuss on lithography. Lithography and uh, uh, sometimes it is called also photolithography is a process by which we can transfer some pattern from photographic mass to a resultant pattern on a wafer. Then we transfer of any kind of structure from mass level 
onto the wafer level is known as photolithography. What is the technique? In photolithography process, a photosensitive polymer film is applied on silicon wafer. This photosensitive polymer film is known as photoresist. This film is dried and then it is exposed with the proper geometrical patterns through a photo mask to UV light or other radiation and finally develop. Instead of UV light, in some cases we use X-ray, electron beam or ion beam. Accordingly, those techniques are known as electron beam lithography or ion beam lithography or X-ray lithography. If you want a, the Gaussian profile at, at, the, at a particular depth of the silicon, then go for 100 kV, there you will get the profile like this. So, that means, uh, subsequent implantation if you go, so then you can get a profile like this, like this which will come if you combine all these things something like that. So, that means, by controlling energy and dose, you can have any arbitrary profile in case of ion implantation, which is not at all possible in normal diffusion technique. Okay. So, uh, the annealing is must in case of ion implantation for removal of damage and for recrystallization as I mentioned, A restoration of electrical activity because you mu, sigma, eta all will be restored after annealing. Then furnace annealing causes appreciable redistribution of impurity. So, people prefer for RTA, which is a rapid thermal annealing and it is suitable for shallow gases. Two kinds of annealings are there, one is furnace annealing and the rapid thermal annealing. So, furnace annealing cause again redistribution of impurities, but if you use RTA means high temperature, very small time, maybe one minute, maybe 45 seconds, you can use for annealing at high temperature say 800 or 900 or 1000 degrees. So, that that will heal up all damages and again it will recrystallize and that is the preferred ion implantation followed by rapid thermal annealing. Now, in conclusion of in ion implantation we can say implantation is an indispensable technique in VLSI fabrication, ultra shallow junctions for deep submicron, CMOS and bi CMOS technology, RTA is essential, high energy, high dose oxygen nitrogen implants are required for SOI fabrication. Recent trend is low energy, high dose and low temperature implants for the submicron VLSI ICT. Let us stop here today. So, next class we will start micro machining of silicon and first step is the etching of silicon, we will discuss in the next lecture. Thank you.